My guest this week is Patty Considine. Patty is an actor who has appeared in 24-Hour Party People, Hot Fuzz, The World's End, In America, Peaky Blinders, Pride, Dead Man's Shoes, and most recently as King Viserys on House of the Dragon. Patty also wrote and directed the feature films Tyrannosaur, for which he won a BAFTA for Outstanding Debut, and his follow-up Journeyman. He's also received Tony and Olivier Award nominations as Best Actor for his performances in The Ferryman, which was directed by Sam Mendes. But Patty is also the lyrical and vocal force behind the band Riding the Low, who have performed with the Charlatans and have just followed up their third LP, The Death of Gobshite Rambo, with the powerful Awake You Sleeping Giants Part 1 12-inch EP. And it is my great pleasure to welcome to Revolutions Per Movie, Patty Considine. Chris, how are you doing, my friend? It's so good to see you. I'm doing all right. How about you? Yeah, not doing bad at all, man. We met in Kentucky. Yes. At a Robert Pollard solo show. Yes, we did. So Guided Bow Voices had broken up. Um, I was no longer in the band, but I was making records with Bob, and I was just trying to go see him live as much as I could. I was just still obsessed. And you came over from you know the uk to see him first time correct first time seeing him live um that at that time i'd seen guided by voices a couple of times and okay. then i i'd seen bob play at the knitting factory when he released from a compound eye so i'd been to a few gigs at that time but i'd never met bob before and i think there were whispers amongst the you know bob's friends and and stuff like that and, and such as yourself that i was a i was a fan and so that show at Kentucky was the first time I ever met Bob. Right. And it was like a fan's dream because everybody, well, I was standing with you for a start, you know, you were the bass player in the band and I got to meet everybody on that, uh, that night, you know, Trader Vic, all these kind of mythical characters that, you know, that, that come from that sort of world, from the Dayton world. And, you know, Jimmy was there. Um, Heed was there, Matt Davis. There was loads of people there yeah. that night. So it was, for Christ's sake, Charlie was there. <laughs> there was just loads of people there. So it was a fan's dream. It's so funny because we're going to talk about Watch Me Jumpstart, which was a 96 documentary about God of My Voices, directed by Banks Tarver. But this is years later, and it's the mythology is still there. God of My Voices had such a unique mythology um, that I really fell in love with. So I feel like in my life, I've had musical things that have just just shattered my world in such a positive way. You know, my life after I discovered Devo, my life after I discovered R.E.M., my life after I discovered Guided by Voices. What were you listening to mostly and gravitating towards before listening to Guided by Voices? Well, I'd gone to university and it was it was when I'd gone to, to college in the early 90s that I was then mixing with, you know, like you do, you mix with a new circle of friends and those friends come with different music tastes. So I was experiencing being introduced to a whole different style of music that I'd never listened to before. I'd never listened to pavement. I'd never heard pavement before. I'd never listened to things like Tinder Six. I'd never listened to the Flaming Lips, you know, and all these sort of bands. Even the Pixies, although I knew of the Pixies, I never really had a deep dive into them. It was all through university, really. And it was around that time that my my music taste was starting to, to change. I remember, like, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, Ewan Spencer, who's a very successful photographer now. Um, I remember him... It was the first person that spoke about Guided by Voices. And then they kept kind of cropping up. And I tell this story because I think it's quite a, you know, it's quite a funny how you arrive at fans. Yes. Um, and I was, and, and he put me a couple of things on a mixtape and, you know, I'd hear them amongst other songs and think, yeah, that's okay. And then around the time of Do the Collapse, because I got into them a bit later. So I wasn't there for the height of the, you know, the Alien Lanes and the Beat Thousands and things. And, and I remember seeing an article in a music magazine in England for Do the Collapse, and they were in the orange sort of like... Yes. Well, I don't know. Why would you describe them as? Uh, they're like uh, work suits, like garage work suits. They're, they're in a uniform, you know, 
It's kind of very Devo, yeah. very Ohio. Like they look like they're going to change yeah. change the oil in your car. <laughs> yeah, it was that type of thing. And I looked and I went, oh, you know, oh, that's the, that's those guys. But didn't pay too much mind. I remember going into a record shop as well and, and seeing them in the section, leafing through it, picking up a couple of CDs and just putting them back down again and never buying them. And I and it's so yeah, I laugh now because <laughs> guarded by voices, uh, Bob's my favorite artist in the entire universe. Yes, um, I'm like addicted to his to his music and his art. So it seems funny now looking back, but it wasn't until about I don't know if it was even 2000 or somewhere around that time that I was in New York at that really great record shop. Um, other music. You remember that place? It shut down. Oh yeah, that was fantastic. It's just yeah. a great shot. And I was with a actually I was with a musician called Dave Dubinin in England at some really shit award thing. And I sat next to him and he kind of looked like a pop star. He's this New York musician. And we start talking. And he writes on a napkin a list of artists to listen to. And amongst them is guided by voices, B thousand and all this. And I went, Yeah, okay, <laughs> I'll check them out. This band keep coming up over the years. And I went to other music and I said to the guy, hey, could you recommend any Guided by Voices? And he kind of leapt from behind the counter. Yeah. You know, I'd never seen somebody, but he went, oh, man, man. And he went over and he dug into the, you know, the section, pulling out somewhere. I guess, what, what do you think to start properly? He went, oh, take this, take this. I walked out with about five different CDs, like Maggie Wig, Alien Lane, Sunfish Holy Breakfast. Wow. Um, and what else did I walk out with? And have I said B thousand? There's about four or five CDs. And I remember I was in a hotel in New York. I was probably doing some shoots or or press there. I can't even remember. And used to have CD players in the room then, Chris. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I remember that. In, in nice hotels. Ooh, wow. You know, the film company <laughs> were playing, and I was just sort of like I put on Mag Earwig, and I got about three or four songs in, and then I go out and while I was getting ready I put it on again it was just what I'd left in the CD yeah. player and then I remember the moment when I was brushing my teeth and I, I I just like sort of stopped and looked at the CD player like with toothpaste dripping and it was not behind the fire yet oh yeah and I just went and I remember my thought being what did he just fucking say like, what was that? You know, like, militant babies came to me, you know, phenomenal stunt kids in the street, Jack and Jill are down the bunker still. And I went, who who writes this yes. stuff? Who writes this music? There was something so defiant about the lyrics, yet so interesting and so original to me. And I went, I've never heard a voice like that. And from that moment, that was it. I've never looked back since. There isn't probably a day that goes by where I don't listen to Robert Pollard since since then. And I just that's it. Once you get hooked on guided by voices, that's it. It's you're in for life and you're in for the entire ride. <laughs> I love that that it was a uh now you can say like, oh, I was you know, here it is 24 years later after you've discovered the band. Oh, I was so late to it. And then here we are 24 years yeah, later after you found out about them. And you're like, yeah, they're still putting four <laughs> records out a year. You know, it's amazing. Yeah. And, and four great records. For me, I had a really funny uh, experience seeing Discovery Them too. I'd read a lot about them, but couldn't really get a good picture of what they were. Um, and I got Alien Lanes. And I wasn't paying too much attention to it. And at that point, I was listening to the Grifters and Sebado and, you know, other lo-fi four-track artists. And when it, when I heard Alien Lanes, I just was like, oh, this lo-fi stuff's just gotten out of hand. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. Like, I just, but I wasn't sitting down with it. I was just kind of like walking around the house. And I sold it. I, like, a week later, took it and sold it. And then about a month later... My band was playing South by Southwest and there was a Matador showcase and we were milling around and we're like, hey, should we go see? Got to my voices are playing. Let's go. Let's go. There's, you know, let's do it. And we walked in and every song that I heard in the two times I barely listened to it, hearing them live, I was like, oh, yeah, I remember this song. This is great. Oh, I remember this song. This is incredible. 
And then I'd be like, what's that song? What's this it's smothered in hugs? What the hell is that? And we kept getting closer yeah. and closer to the stage. And I just was like, oh, they are a rock band who, and they touch on this in the movie, they're a rock band that just, even the studios in Dayton were like, we don't get what you're doing. And they just had to make it themselves. Yeah. They weren't like trying to be necessarily arty about it. It was necessity. You know, I think Bob would have liked to have made records more like Do the Collapse with things, but it was just kind of where they were at the time. And I was blown away. I mean, this is a lineup with Greg Demos, Tobin, Mitch, Kevin, and Bob. Yeah. And to see just Mitch smoking nonstop, spinning around in a circle, Greg Demos unplugging himself, running around the stage. And his rock pants. Bob kicking. And I just was like, <laughs> you're an idiot. This is amazing. And literally the next morning, myself and the two people I with, we went to the record store and we were fighting over whatever we could find by guided by voices to take. Yeah. And after that, it was like, I'm, I'm hooked. But it, you know, I, I think the film is interesting because a lot of their career up to the point of them kind of, I guess you'd say breaking in 94, 95 is just about just making it for themselves. And I think, you know, we've all done that with music where you're like, I love playing music so much. I don't care what anyone thinks. Yeah. I think like the, Bob says that really early on in the documentary, actually, he says we were just doing it for ourselves. It was just doing it. And I think that's the best thing, you know, you just do it because you enjoy it. Yeah. And it's just amongst your group of friends, but that's what I got. I mean, when this, I mean, when I got into the band, it was the very early days of the internet, really. Yes. You know, it's not like as simple as it is now. So I didn't know how to properly find stuff. And it was still those great days that if you happen to go to somewhere like New York, or I remember going to Amoeba even in LA and, and walking out of there because they've got these big sort of plastic sleeves that they put stuff in, you know, right. <laughs> and the CDs at the time, you can shove your arm through them. Yeah. And I had them racked up on my arm, you know, and this guy's going, would you want a basket? And I'm like, yeah, actually, that'd be great. <laughs> and it was just full of uh full of stuff that I couldn't get. So I was digging right. deep, but I was still couldn't get a, a, an idea of what what it was about, what, what Bob was about. Right, me too. You know, it was just, and, and this is part of the mythology is that it's this guy and he's a what? He's, he's an athlete. Yeah. So he's a college like, or school athlete, you, you know, and he's pitched this no hitter, which I've had described to me now, so I know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> and I was sort of going... Well, this guy's like a, a sports star, but he's also uh, he's a teacher and he teaches. He doesn't teach sport. He teaches what? You know, and it was interesting. I mean, finding that he got his inspiration from some of the songs from kids and things. And he lives where? You know, where's that? You know, and it all built to it. I remember seeing a picture and going, I wonder which one actually is Bob. Me too. And I'm going, it must be that guy there. That must be the guy. And... It just all added to it. I think it was probably the last time that you, you, you could probably have that experience and go, who are these guys? Who is this guy? And what's this world all about? Because nobody's writing stuff like this anywhere. Yeah, they had all those seven inches coming out at such a clip right then that they were all so different. You know, Plantations of Pale Pink. Yeah. Oh, fast Japanese spin cycle, that kind of stuff. And yeah, all that stuff. They were like different records by different bands. I mean, it was hard to get a grasp on what the Guided by Voices sound was because sometimes it was just gnarly, like Matter Eater Lad, you know, barely held together, you know, um, with scrappy drums. And and then, then you'd have just something so beautiful you yeah. know, all these things where a, a beautiful song would come up next to it, Chicken Blows, and you'd just be like, well, who who are they? Are they the Postal Blowfish Band or are they this? Yeah, like, which one are it they? Was, and I just, I loved it because I was, I really at that point was like, well, I think this might just be the band for me because they're everything. They're the Beatles, they're Wire, they're R.E.M., they're Guided by Voices, and... I just, I loved that when I was hearing this stuff for the first time, and again, like you said, pre-internet. So 
You just had to find it yeah. and look at it and get it home and be like, there's six amazing songs on this. Yeah. Why are they not? Why aren't they the biggest, biggest band, band in the world? In the world? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, um, I remember the first time I went out to Ohio and you just went recently to Ohio and I want to talk to you about this too. Yeah. It was like, it was kind of culture shock for me, you know, being from Portland and just going to the Monument Club. And I just remember them being like, Br bring bring some beer for yourself. And I'm like, cool, how, how much? And they're like, bring two cases. And I'm like, okay. And I show up and everyone's got two cases for themselves. And I'm like, well, I'm only here for two hours before I have to go home on the plane. But I just remember it being one of the, I laughed so hard with them. They're so funny and so weird and unusual. And they've created their own language that's been around since high school because they're all friends yeah. from, you know, years ago. But I just remember, you know, when I joined Got My Voices, spending time in Dayton, it was amazing how little there was to do there mm -hmm. that had to do with something like music. Like there wasn't a ton of cool record stores. There wasn't cool bands coming through at this point. Even when we would play, it was underappreciated, you know? Yeah. And it's like Bob kind of is in his own little uh, satellite within Dayton yeah. that most of Dayton doesn't even know about. So what was your experience? And, you know, because, I mean, you, you've read about it. You've seen this documentary, which showcases it. What was your trip to Ohio like? Well, it was like, you know, the, 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 the Banks Tarver film was really a, a massive part of that because, you know, like I, I was saying about this mythology, you know, you, you're trying to gather as, as much information as you can. So Watch Me Jumpstart was a really big part of that in getting to have a little window into that world. And it, and it did seem like very remote and it did seem unusual. And it did seem like this, like there was this small pack of friends who kind of huddled together somehow and and found this rock and roll. You know, there's the something that they could yeah. could hang on to and some kind of interest. Um, and so going to Dayton for me, it was a bit like I'd say it was a bigger buzz than going to Liverpool and going on the Beatles tour because. By now, we gathered, gathered so much sort of imagery and information, and from other films like The Who Went Home and Cried. Yeah. So when we went to Dayton, we were kind of going on the Dayton tour, and he and Mac Davis both took us on different tours and showed us different things. But the first place we went to was Bob's house on Titus, and there was the porch, and and you know you look at it and go, that's where they did, you know, The Who Went Home and Cried, yeah. and. You know, like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And he's going, oh, wow, wow. And it, it, it does take on this whole different mythology. And then, like, Matt's going, look over there. You see that house there? That's where the vampire lived on Titus. And you're going, what, what? <laughs> you start to see this, like, imaginary world and a real, real world, but also this imaginary take on everything that Bob did lyrically, you know, through these songs. He did paint this different world we went up to where the house that he grew up as a kid and um across the road was canary court yeah and things like that you know so from from uh, blimps go 90 and you go there's all these different references to songs and it kind of blows your mind you go past big school you yeah you know you head to the airport and you know Matt's going, that's where touchdown jesus was and it's just that whole hoffman prairie flying field yeah that blew my mind i mean we had recorded that song before I even knew that that was just not something off the top of Bob's head. I was like, oh, that's a really cool phrase. Huffman Prairie Flying yeah. Field. It just flows. And then you're like, wait, that's a real thing? I was so yeah, late to it. It's a real place. Yeah. Or even Need More Songs. You're like, well, of course he is a publishing company called Need More Songs because he has a million songs. And then you're like, no. Yeah. It's an actual It's song. a place. <laughs> And you're like, what <laughs> the hell is going on here? It's Needmore. There's the drive-in movie theater, you know, where they took all those early photos. And, yeah. You know, you, it, it's like doing a tour through somebody's life. Yeah. Those songs have got such a fantastic history to them. Um, and they're so ingrained in you that it, it really was something else. It was the equivalent of, of going to Strawberry Fields for me. 
it was it it was that big a deal. And even you know, he and Matt and everybody meeting the guys, they're all a part of that same thing, that that same mythology. So yeah, you just went along and it was such a great time. Now you were saying earlier on about um people not really knowing, and that's one of the things that blew me away because for the 40th anniversary, they did two shows at the Masonic Temple in Dayton. And I was told that people were ringing up for tickets and it sold out. And the woman on the phone had said to somebody, like, who are these guys anyway? Like, what's, what's the kind of big deal with them? And it's like, don't you know? You know, this, this, they're from Dayton, Ohio, this guy, Robert Pollard. And, and that's one of the things that blows me away is people don't know him. They don't know what he does. So when you meet at Wings and there's like hundreds of people there yes. queuing in a line to have their five minutes with Bob, locals are sort of going, what the fuck's going on here? Who's like, totally. That's just Bob. Yep. You know, what are all these people doing here? And it's like, well, they're here for Bob. They still can't get over it. That was happening when <laughs> I was there, like in, you know, 98, 99. It was like, oh, yeah, it's Bobby. Yeah. You know, like, oh, yeah, he's with his crazy fans or whatever. No acknowledgement. No, you know, not even just a bit of like a good for him kind of thing. It was really, really odd. And it's incredible that still it has this kind of weird uh, separation. But, you know, I always found Ohio to be, you know, I, I come from a place where if the Blazers lose, Everybody goes on with their day. It doesn't matter, like, in terms of sports, culture, like, people can get up the next day. Being in Ohio, I mean, things like sports culture and competition mean the world to a lot of people yeah. there. It's like they're upset for most of the week when their team loses. They're pissed. And I think it there's a bit of a competitive streak in the Midwest that just doesn't happen on the West Coast, for instance. And um, yeah. it's just like people can't give people their due. I mean, this is a band that couldn't give away propellers to people. Um, and Bob was always teasing people about like, hey, if you'd taken the five copies I wanted to give you and you're like, no, one's good enough. Like you could have a lot of money right now selling these on eBay. Yeah. Thousands. You know, and they would have record destroying parties of like forever since breakfast you know, let's smash them in the street because we're frustrated and it's, what are we going to do? We have 500 of these, you know, and I just, but I do love that the band also had such innocence in terms of the beginnings. Like we're going to take a record label that exists and use their logo on our record. That should be okay. Yeah. Or we're going to walk from our house to the venue with our instruments on and then walk on the stage and set up plug in and play. It's like these concepts of like what <laughs> rock is that really isn't real. And I think all these things of Bob being pushed against and not being celebrated have really added some spectacular uh, energy and passion into his art, I think. Yeah, I do too. I, I feel like I've, I've been there as well. Like you say, it's a very small oriented place it's very a very blue collar place and um you, you you do sort of look at it i do i do think how how did bob like come out of all of this yeah how did somebody with his mind come out of this because it's not just playing to me it's not just playing rock and roll i mean that 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 was it in the early days and obviously there's something that fuels bob that that music has obviously been the the, the kind of in his veins but where did he come from? Yeah. Where the hell did that guy sprout up in all of this? How did he grow in Dayton, Ohio? This kind of industrious place, um, a tough place. Where did he come from in all of that? And, that? and I think that's one of the things that fascinates me about him. Where did he get that language from? <laughs> what is that? Um, and that's why I feel like I, I, I do think he's he's a little he's touched with something, and I do think you know I, 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 the, the word genius you use it very very sparingly, but I think it applies to him. Yeah, I agree. Um, it just does not think the same as anybody else that I've met from from there. 
And he's a bit like Elvis as well, you know. I kind of think he's the Elvis. <laughs> he's got this, like, I, I got the data mafia, you know. He's got his, his men around it, like the Memphis mafia. That <laughs> no, I hear you. But I don't think Elvis was, like, making collages then being like, I want to write a song about nah. these 12, 12 things I've made out of my yearbook. Um, I mean, the, those yeah. things are nah. incredible. Like, just, you know, the, the I, I want to talk about those three areas because um, I know you're a big fan of his visual work, too. But, you know, just spending time with Bob and just seeing he gets up in the morning and he just starts making a collage today. And that's what he's doing. He's just making art or, you know, um, just seeing him in the van constantly working on lyrics was really incredible. Just his work ethic is super strong. I, you know, I wanted to talk a bit about his lyrics because I feel like Robert Pollard and Guided by Voices is kind of like this complete package. It's the rock thing. It's, you know, it's it's this chunk coming at you of a multitude of you know uh, a massive discography and their live shows and this but i really do feel like he's one of the greatest lyricists of all time i do too yeah i do i think i i i, I think he's unchallenged and and i don't you know usually people have a body of work i get a bit kind of prickly when people just think that the you, you know, they'll pick an era and go, that's the best era. So, you know, the Alien Lanes era, propeller through that, that's that's the prime thing. And I, it only irks me a bit, A, because I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but mostly it's like, well, I, I don't agree with you. I, his body of work now, even the bo body of work you guys did, the Boston Spaceships, of anything outside Guided by Voices, I think Boston Spaceships is, is incredible. Oh, thanks. And he's up there with some of the best Guided by, Bo Guided by Voices songs. Um, but the, the, the kind of even even since the guys joined the band, you know, Bobby and and uh, and, and, and the other lads, Mark, it, it's just grown into something else. The, the quality yeah. of the songwriting is unbelievable. And like most people have a, a good era you know, they have an era that defines them. And maybe that era does define Guided by Voices to a lot of people. Maybe a lot of people are stuck there. But I cannot figure out how this guy just keeps putting out great work. Yeah. Great work. Not just kind of okay, mediocre, that's fine work. Great, great work. And one of the sad things for me about Robert Pollard is that I feel, as a lot of fans do, I suppose, is that He's, he's, he's very, very underappreciated by the establishment. Now, that's a cool thing. Okay, that's, that's cool. But at the same time, I think there should be credit where it's due. And a lot of artists don't. They just don't have that kind of depth. They don't have that stamina that they've done their best work or they might leave it five years and try to put something out. It's just relentless. Yeah. And the quality is of a very, very high standard. And that's something I think is unmatched by any songwriter. Yeah, I agree. I know it's a very broad thing to say, but I, I really do. No, and each album is like a complete restart in a weird way. Alien Lanes to Under the Bushes to Mag Earwig. They're not similar. And it's the same with these new records. They seem like he's he's got a concept He's got a vibe with the songwriting. He's got a lyrical slant. And I just, it was always fascinating because the albums were always changing while we were making them. Things were getting cut. Things were being brought in. Um, the only exception was Let It Beard by Boston Spaceships was the only record that, that I know that we made or, well, I don't know. Up to that point, it was the only one he said that the order of the tracks he gave me them in on a cassette to work on were the same order that were on the record and everything stayed because, you know, we were yeah. pulling things off zero to 99 to be on singles and adding something else. And, you know, just, it's just super fun that way to just never know what was going to happen. And Trader Vic says it in the film. He's like, you get a cassette of something. It's amazing. It's the best thing he's ever made. Don't change a thing. Then two weeks later, Songs are gone. New songs are on it. It's reordered, different titles, and it's a hundred times yeah. better, you know? And it's true. Like, if you find those uh, early versions of, like, Mag Earwig 
or under the bushes um, and stuff like that. It's just, yeah, they just, Mag Earwig's a better album in the end than it was when he was originally sequencing and what was put on it. That's another thing I think he's really great at. He obviously writes a ton of music, but he knows how to make a, a, a complete musical statement with each record that like, if this is meant to be a six song EP or this is meant to be a side project, this is Lexo and the Leapers over here, and this is Phantom Tollbooth over yeah. here. They feel, they never feel undercooked. They're just completely invigorating and uh, just confident. Well, even when he compiles other artists' music, and you know, if he's putting a CD together or something, know. you know, it has this. It's it's very coherent. You know, I've been given some of his stuff by yourself and and others, and. You, you just sort of go, this is a fantastic compilation of the Bee Gees. Yes. And it's all the deepest cuts from all the, you know, Trafalgar or whatever. There's all this stuff on there and you're going, this is, this is fucking incredible. Like yeah. everything feels like it's been thought of and put into, into place. I mean, to not kind of lose momentum with it as well. I think that's the truth. Because of course there's times where, you know, he wanted to stop Guided by Voices and he wanted to, you know, he went out just as himself or he went out with Boston Spaceships. Yeah. And but and it must be very difficult for an artist like Bob when you, you kind of realise, well, actually, they want Guided by Voices. It doesn't matter. And, and the name does mean something, but that's something that he's created. You know, that's something he's established. It's funny, like when he reformed the original lineup of Guided by Voices... I was kind of excited because so many people never got to see him and Tobin on a stage together. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I always loved the way their voices worked together and the way they just, Tobin was such a strange foil for him in a weird way, such a strange collaborator. You're like, yeah. there's this guy who barely moves, who looks really haunted. He, he talks like this when you talk to him and then he sings like in a totally different voice. Yeah, it's yeah. like, you're like, what's your story? Everyone yeah, in this band, this you're like, about? what? What is Mitch's story? What? It was, you know. Yeah. So I was, I was excited for that, and it made sense. I mean, the name, it, it rings large. It's one of, the, also one of the greatest band names of all time. So, I get it. You know, uh, I remember when he said we were going to be called Boston Spaceships. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> we're not going to be called like Brainbow or something. Like, you know, I was like, okay, Boston Spaceships. I had to kind of wrap my head around it and stuff. It was so funny. Out of all yeah. the things. I went to those classic lineup gigs. Uh, well, I went to one in Iowa City. Yeah. And it was quite crazy. That's another thing about the band, Chris, was it, you want it to belong. It, I, I just, I remember seeing them in Nottingham and um, there was people stood on the side of the stage. And I'm not some kind of crazy fucker, you know, but I was just sort of like, I want to be there. I want to be a part of this. I want, I want to be a part of this thing. There was yes. something about it that I wanted to belong to it. I'm like, this means something to me, and I want to be a part of this thing. And, you know, I remember, like, you know, Bob shouting out, this is Christian Animation Torch Cat. And I went, yeah, you know, because I knew every word. And he just went down the line and found me and went. <laughs> and, you know, I'd never met him at that point. He wouldn't know me, but I was just, you know, inflated by it. Yeah, there's a lot of things I do in in the band. I, I don't I don't high kick like Bob. It's already been established that in my band, you know, I've done a few kicks over the years. They're not Bob Pollard kicks. <laughs> Bob is the sidekick champion, and uh, I can't do. And by the way, I can't even kick anymore. I fucked my hip up, so that's not happening <laughs> from now on. Yeah. But just those things, I think, you know, in in your own band. You just felt that inclusion. And I think sometimes even when I'm on stage doing something and you look someone in the eye and you see someone singing your song back and you just give them a nod of appreciation, I, I think I know what that feels like because I felt that myself because I'm a fan myself and I stood in the audience down the front and, and received that, you know. It just felt yeah. like a place to belong. And I always think, I have this thing about Bob where he's, he's such a... a, a bright guy but he doesn't alienate people with his in intelligence or his gift you know it's not about that it's not about we're going to stand here and look at our fucking shoes for the night and I'm presenting this thing and right. it, it's more like no we're in this together and that's that's another thing that I felt from the band I, uh, like the inclusion of it all 
Um, I could see the rock and roll side of it, and I could also see the beauty of the writing in it. Yeah, it's incredible. I, I had the same thing. And I remember I wrote a letter to Bob, and he wrote back. You know, it was just like he was super accessible and kind. And, you know, those cassettes he'd make for people and trade around. I just, I mean, imagine Paul McCartney sitting down and making a mixtape. I mean, that's what it was like. It was like somebody who loved music yeah. so much that he wants to make his version of the Trog's best record. Like, I took their Trog's records and he's making the definitive statement of a band he loves. And I just, yeah. he's, I love that he loves music so much that he still loves to go out and buy records and is still on the search for things. And it's just, I think it's lovely. That's never stopped, has it? And I think that's the thing that fuels him also is that, and that makes him a true artist is that he, he, he genuinely loves music. I was talking to Mark Shue when we were in Dayton and um, he was talking about going record shopping with Bob and saying, you, 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 he'll pull an album out, something you've never heard of, and he'll go, oh, this is great. You know, you got to listen to this. This track is it. And he'll go into one about it. And he says, you'll walk out the store then with like <laughs> the, all these albums under your arms that you've never intended buying, but Bob's convinced you how amazing they are uh, but i feel like that about guided by voices i feel that way about them i buy people their records i give them to people i mean i i think i i had a bizarre day once it sounds like i'm a guy that swans around la all the time but it's, <laughs> i just happened to be there and normal happiness came out and i, I brought it from amoeba and I had it in my bag and i bumped into um simon Pegg and edgar and nick and we ended up back at Quentin Tarantino's house. And he said, oh, what'd you buy? You know, and I said, oh, I've got it. I said, have you heard of this guy? And he went, no, no. I said, you, you love this, mate. Yeah. And I gave him the copy of Normal Happiness. I don't know if you ever played it, but he should have, because there's some great, you know. Oh, that's a great great car, great car music in there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I, I buy them for everybody and give them and say, you've got to listen to this. And some people do give it the chance and go. Fucking hell, this is amazing. Yeah, the people who get it are in it. I wanted to ask you if Bob's art has influenced like your screenwriting or any of your directing decisions or acting. Because I know, you know, he's a big influence on us musically. Yeah. I think he I think just the whole there was something about his writing, his lyrics and melodies that inspired me to want to start writing firstly music and i you know i've got demos the final things don't come out sounding like these demos but i've got demos where you know shelly has gone is this bob <laughs> <laughs> no no it's me but it won't sound like that in the end you know right. I, I, it won't it won't sound like bob in the end but there is a certain thing that when I got into his writing, it just opened something within me. I just found found a bit more freedom in what I was doing. And I think that some of that freedom I found, I applied to when I, for example, wrote my first film, Tyrannosaur. I kind of went into it having been freed up by Bob's writing, you know? It just, it just, I always say like it opened the door in my head where there's no rules. There's no rules. You know, so much of it, it, there's so many bands that I love, but they wouldn't make me want to start a band because it looks too difficult. It looks too finicky. It's yes. slightly alienated. There was something about the immediacy of Bob's music that made me go, I want to do that. I want to do that. And then that same mentality carried me over into writing. It was just a freedom where I went, there's no rules. There's no rules. And, and I've, I've, I've retained that with writing songs. And sometimes I will, I don't mind saying, I'll start writing a song and I'll imitate Bob. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of imitate him a bit as I'm doing it. But I know that by the time I come to do it, that it would have gone. But even that imitation opens something up. Right. You know, it, 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 it's like a, it's almost like a character. A little bit and that frees me from thinking from my own mind you know from my own 
does self, the restrictions go. And I was like that with screenwriting. But, you know, the sad thing with screenwriting is that it just became restricted again. You know, I lost that thing. When I made Tyrannosaur, it was very much in the spirit of Bob, I'm, I'm doing this for me. Right. And then when I made my second film, I felt a bit like, well, I'm doing this for me, but I'm going to show them what I can do. And I'm going to make this for the audience. And that's why it felt like a failure. So I think one of the great things I've learned from Bob is that you've got to make it for yourself. Yes. You try and roll the dice and do a, and make do the collapse, which I adore that album. I don't care what any fucker says about Hold On Hope. It's a great, great song. And if Glenn Campbell can cover it, then there's your confirmation yes. that it's a fucking great song. Yes. <laughs> so shut up about Hold On Hope because it's fine and it's great. And I love that album. But, you know, that was the kind of roll of the dice, wasn't it? Yeah. But it's interesting. I, I you know, I'm, I'm sounding like the biggest name dropping idiot here. But this was an interesting thing. I, I, I at the time I've done a film called In America with Jim Sheridan, who's an Irish filmmaker, and who who's, happens to be friends with Bono. So over that period, I met Bono a few times. Who's actually he's a really great guy, and I remember sitting and talking to him once about certain bands, and. I said to him, I said, have you ever heard of Guided by Voices? He goes, yeah, he goes, I have. He goes, you know, Edges edges got into them, you know? And I went, oh, oh, right. And he went, yeah. And he said this thing that was interesting. He went, yeah, he says, they kind of want it, but they don't. <laughs> and I thought, wow, you know, that's, that's what, what a thing to say. Yeah. I sort of knew, I sort of knew, what he meant in a way because we said earlier on you know why aren't they the great big greatest band in the world yes but i think to be an artist like robert pollard i i i don't think there's any room for compromise and i think to be on that platform you have to do a lot of compromising and i don't think that's in bob's nature and i think that's what makes him a true artist and a cut above everybody else of his ilk he's a cut above all of them yeah and so, I mean, I remember, I don't know if it was the night we met the first time. It was, it was the next morning because we were sat together and Bob was talking about when, you know, that time when Warner were going around trying to sign all the indie bands. Yep. And I think they've got the Flaming Lips. They've probably done the REM, the big, big one with REM. And they were signing up the Flaming Lips and they'd caught it, guided by Voices and Bob. And Bob said he'd gone around this guy's place and he had this massive record collection. So Bob was rooting through it, looking and pulling out all the stuff. And this guy from the label, was they were listening to Alien Lanes, a, a cut of Alien Lanes. And this exec apparently said, you know, you know this will be great once we re-record it. Yep. And Bob said, oh, no, man, no, that's it. Because this is it. This is the record. He says, you put this out, and then we'll talk about doing the next one your way. I said, but this is it. And that's it. Yeah. It doesn't go any further than that. That's bold because there aren't enough dicks in the room that people would suck to get on something like Warner. It's right. a bold, bold move. It's a bold move. And one I respect. They start the band in a period where the underground is still DIY. You're self-pressing records. You're making the art. You're trying to figure out distribution. There's no real big leap you can make if you're just a scrappy band that's self-producing stuff, right? And you're not yeah. even allowed. You're not even liked in your hometown to play live, right? They're 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 done playing live. They say that in this in this film. They're like, we just retreated and just started making records. They were like, well, if nobody else in Dayton likes it, the world's not going to like it. If we can't even get our hometown to be behind it, what are they going to think out there? But he was making an album a year, you know, still, and yeah. just never stopped. And those are amazing records, those early records. Again, you're like, who are you? What school teacher in Dayton is making self-inflicted aerial nostalgia? Yeah. It's like as your third record, 
this is like the record yeah. people make when they've made like 11 things or they've broken out on their own. The language is just incredible. And I think by the time the 90s rolled around and there were major labels interested in already the sub pop grunge thing had come and gone. I just think it's really cool that there is still this thing of being like, no, this is the complete idea. Alien Lanes, this is how it sounds. This is what it is. And it's true. Under the Bushes doesn't sound anything like Alien Lanes. I remember that being kind of not a head scratcher, but being like, oh, this sounds really different. But then yeah. by the time official Iron Man Rally song comes on, you're like, well, fuck. This is why. Yeah. This is incredible. Like, and But it's so funny to think that that was like the hi-fi version of God of My Voices at that point. And it's not. It's not. No. Nah. I'm really glad that the band didn't start in 92 or 93 when the opportunities were just uh, bigger at that point for underground music. I think, you know, yeah. having the 80s hangover of DIY is really essential to Bob. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, too. I, I just feel like, you know, there must be times where you know, you look at the bands that did kind of peak from that era, like the pavements and yeah. go, what is, what is it? What's, what's that thing? Um, what was it? Accessibility? What was it? I know that when I went the other week or the other month now, I'm watching them on, on two nights and how old is Bob now? You know, he's well into his sixties. Yeah. And I just looked at this fucking band and went, this is the greatest American rock band. There's no doubt. They are the greatest American rock band like that are, that are still going. And the devotion, the devotion was unbelievable. People traveled the world to be there in that room to see them and to see this, this great band. Um, and you often look and go, what would the story have been if it did go the way of an REM? What would the, what would the story have been then? Uh, yeah. um, I, I think part of it is that I don't think, you know, the mainstream will ever get it. And why, why, would, why should they? You know, it's like the, people feel like they own Guided by Voices. And... And I think that's what makes it so personal, a connection with them, not just because they're still relatively underground in a way, right. you know, relatively. It's just that, you know what, if, no, if nobody, if people in the wider world don't want this, then fuck them, you know, like, because this is ours. It's really prevalent in the film. There's a little bit of a sadness in the film, I feel like. Like a, they're a little, they're proud, but they're defeated a little. That's interesting. Yeah. They're afraid like, oh, someone's going to take this away from me. And Well, you can see in like Kev and Mitch that there's some hope that this thing might do something. This gives them purpose. Yes. These guys are, you know, these guys like it, it, the term's blue collar in America, isn't it? Yes. It's, the, the, that's what these guys seem to be. And it seems that they've got a lot more hope pinned on it than even Bob in a way. Yeah. Um, they are this weirdly at that stage in that, if referring to the film, like this mythical, almost forgotten band. Yeah. In a way. Um, in some, I know what you're saying because it, it sometimes feels like it's already been and gone. It's kind of over. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, because who would have thought that, in 2024, there were, they would still be making music. I mean, they already were around longer than most independent bands ever were at this point. Yeah, you know? um, they'd been by the time this film was being recorded or filmed, they'd been around 10 years. That's a lifetime in indie music at that point. Also, one of the amazing things about it is they were also older than everyone in the scene. So when we yeah. saw them at South by Southwest, we walked out and we were like, those 35 year old motherfuckers were amazing. <laughs> Cause we had not seen anyone at 35 
doing that yet. No one had aged into it. Now everybody like doesn't stop. You know, if you see cat power, you're like, all right, well, everyone's getting older, right? Yeah. Um, Stephen Malcolm is, you know, Thurston Moore. But at the time, it was like they were older. And when you're 23, it was like I could see the lines on their faces already. And now it's so funny how far beyond like how much older I am than that. I remember when I joined Gotta Buy Voices, Bob would always tease me. He'd be like, Chris, he'll always be younger. And that's when he started this band than when our band broke. He was like, he's younger than when people, when I finally got to be celebrated for being Gotta Buy Voices. This motherfucker over here is younger than I was. And it was just like, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm like 33. But at that point, <laughs> but it just, it it was interesting to see that, these people were kind of not midlife, but definitely in careers, had had jobs and choices in Dayton, and music was their constant escape. I also think as well that there's a there's a drive in him, Chris. Sorry to interrupt. I think there's a drive no. when you when you hear stories when he when they sign their first deal and he goes back to the school to show them the check and things like that. Yeah, there's, there's, I think there's still this sense in Bob. That that he's you know prove, trying to prove himself a bit to everybody in in data. I, I got a sense that I might be completely wrong, but I got that sense from being out there that this guy is still driven to prove himself to these people around here, the people, the Canary Court people, you know all these. Yeah. And I think that must. I think that might be part of his fuel as well. I think the film really captures a cool time of them starting to be known, but they're still relatively unknown. And mm. the future, I mean, the, the future of this band is, is not long after this film is shot. Things are changing. I mean, Under the Bushes is coming up and then this lineup is done. You know, yeah. there's a little bit, a couple, couple songs in Mag Earwig. And I remember seeing Cobra Verde on that tour and it being a big adjustment, you know, because at that point you're like, oh, he's got, it's Bob and another band. It's Cobra Verde yeah. behind him. And it was a trip and it was, it was great. You know, like by the end of the show, you're like, well, that was cool. You know, like he's, he's still wanting to go, but it did feel a little bit like, oh, uh, it's Bob with a backing band and it's called Got It By Voices. But then. By the time you get to do the collapse and, you know, the constant lineup changes and things like that, it was like, yeah. it was really apparent that, yeah, Bob is guided by voices. Yeah, yeah. He's, he is the reason that these things exist. He's the one telling people to show up when and what we're going to do. And I remember one of the things I loved in this film is when they're recording uh, Systems Crash uh, with, Tobin yeah, with Tobin in the four track. And you can't tell what the song is yet. It's so abstract. And he's singing and he's like, rewind it back. He sings a harmony. Yeah. And I remember what the weekend that Guided by Voices broke up originally, I was staying with him at, in his house in Dayton. And we went up to his attic and he had me bring my cassette four track and we recorded some stuff in the attic that weekend that was on Zoom, the EP. And yeah. I just remember just being like, Oh, I get to do that. I get to see this happen. And it was total magic because yeah. he was like, I'm gonna drone on one string here. Okay, now I'm gonna sing this part here. And then you're like, these don't sound in key at all. Or like they're not even attached. And then he adds one little moment, and then you're the the big picture just goes, you know, and you see it and you hear it. And he adds a couple more things, and you're like, this is the greatest song ever. <laughs> it is really amazing. And I'm so glad that that's in the film too. Um, yeah. Because his his way of working is very unusual. Yeah. That's the only way that you can make three or four albums a year is to work the way he does. Yeah. You know, um, which is, you know, part improvisation, you know, over lyrics that have been written, you know, that he's he's worked so hard on and then fleshing it out with other individuals to kind of, figure out what what his needs are musically it's killer yeah i would love to see him write a song yeah. there's that beautiful moment where they do 14 cheerleader as well that's uh 
It's, okay. it's, it's such a beautiful moment. There's so many great things in that. And it's all beer and basements. You know, it just seems like guys hanging around with guitars, with a can of beer, in a basement, in a sticky club doing gold star for Robot Boy. You know? It's so great. And, silk screening stuff in a basement. Well, we saw those silk screens. We saw those silk screens over at Rockathon. We went oh, over good. there with, with Matt and Heed, and, and those original silk screens are in there. And so we were just like, well, I was with Joe, you know, my son, and I was just like, oh, shit, you know, would they notice if I nick this? <laughs> <laughs> but it was. It was like artifacts. Yeah, right. These are the screens. You know, right. this, wow. is, this is ridiculous. Yeah, we went to the beer store, you know, the drive through beer shop. Yes. We went through that. You know, you, you've got to do that. It's, it's like going to a, a Guided by Voices theme park. And then we went to the bandstand, you know, and did the pose and, you know, kicked <laughs> around a bit and all that. I mean, what, in a way, what, a, what an incredible, magical thing is created there. Yeah, you're uh, not going on a pavement tour, you know? No. It's like that's never going to happen. There's no. something uh, really, again, like you said, it is magical and it is – and it's still a mystery. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I worked yeah. with him. And I still don't know where he pulls these melodies from or these lyrical phrases or comes up with a collage. I mean, a lot of our projects, you know, with the um, Brown Submarine, Boston Spaceship's first record or Bad Football by the Takeovers was him making a piece of art and us just staring at it, drinking a bunch of alcohol, looking at it all night, being like, what would this album sound like? I want to hear this album. What is it? And he's like, it's a takeover, bad football. And you're like, great. And he's like, well, why don't you write it and I'll sing it? And then it's like, yeah. it's just like that. It's the inspiration is really addictive and super, it's really fun. Definitely bands. I don't know anybody that works that way that would write a list of band names, just come up with the, the wordplay and, and just write a list of band names and go, oh, that's cool. I wonder what that band sounds like. <laughs> And then create a band from it and or a song from it or something from it. Like, yeah. it just blows my mind. I don't know anybody that uses that way in, that would do like you just explain, create a, a collage and artwork and look at it and find inspiration until something lands. You know, I want to see that band. I want to hear that band. I want to know what kind of music they're going to make. Nobody works like that. No, no. It's unique, Chris. It's his own thing that he's developed and, and I still, I still haven't read an interview or seen anything that's shown me how, explained how, <laughs> or why. <laughs> no, I mean, we talk about it all the time with the Beatles. You're like, oh, these four people got together. They're just, what a weird combination. It's magical. But here's one person that is like magical and doing all yeah. this stuff. It's really remarkable. And he's there and he's in a, in a rock t-shirt and he's drinking a beer and you kind of go, what? And you come out with lyrics like, you know, black without warning, the sky and the morning star hits, look, we are angels on wires from a pregnant sky. <laughs> You're like, where the fuck did you pull that? Because that's very enlightened. Right. Very, very deep stuff. It's beautiful. Yes. Yeah, you're definitely not getting it through a drive-in at Dayton, you know. So <laughs> no, you're not getting out of the beer store <laughs> or, or or you know on the field or whatever, you know. Well, Patty, I have a couple questions that are geeky, but I can't help it because I, you know, these are the kind of things I would ask myself as well. Yeah, yeah. The, so if you you mentioned that you you know give albums out to people to turn them on, what currently would you give to somebody as a starter got it by voices record? Where would you start? Oh, you know, that's so tough. I, I did Adam Buxton's podcast and he wasn't up with the stuff from the last, you know, six years or whatever. Um, so, um, he said, Oh, you know, do me a compilation for the podcast. I think I ended up putting nearly every song from every album on it. Um, <laughs> You know what I mean? I was just yeah. like, just I, well, I, I just can't 
it's so yeah. difficult to do it, isn't it? Edgar Wright did the same thing. He's like, oh, do me a compilation of Buffs. And I'm going, what do I leave out? Yeah. Like, stop stop being so precious. Just do put in, don't overdo it. Just put 12 songs on there. And I go, uh, I can't. <laughs> I can't pick 12 songs. Yeah. I, it's impossible. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what to say. You know, I just cannot fucking do it. It's... <laughs> So even giving an album, I mean, the obvious thing, oh, I've listened to B Thousand, I've listened to, right. and that's turned a lot of people on who can stick with it. You know, people are very much like, well, what's this? Is it a load of demos? I remember one guy said that to me. It sounds like a load of demos. I'm like, fuck off. Right. Yeah, I think if I would have heard B Thousand first, I would have been, I would, I would have gotten it in a funny way over Alien Lanes because Alien Lanes is just like even more hiss oriented. It's a little more abstract at times. But once you did, once you, I found that, you know, we even listened to them, that I, I just very quickly saw past it to yeah. the beauty of the songs. The production didn't mean anything to me at all. I mean, having to buy a record back within two months and realize you were on the wrong side of it was a total lesson. You know, it was like, yeah, I made a mistake. You know, I was like, oh, auditorium, I understand you now. Like, you know. Yeah. But at first it was just like, it was, it was funny. And it, and again, I, got to join that band later on and play you these got songs. to be in the band so it was so funny to be like yeah i sold i got a my voices record before i got it you know you were in the band yeah at this point i was not playing music i was kind of done when i joined got it by voices i was just a fan i was like i think this is all i'm gonna do is just kind of go to these band this band's shows and you know you know bob was kind enough to let me you know come to dayton and hang out and yeah. travel with them in the van. And um, I was kind of like, this is filling all my needs, you know? And it wasn't until, you know, he, at one point he said, well, if somebody ever leaves, you're in. And I'm like, well, no one's ever going to leave. This is the greatest job yeah. in the world. And sure enough, someone did. And I got in. I just uh, kind of fantasized about being in the band too, because it looks yeah. so fun. And the songs are so fun to learn and play. Have you ever had those fantasies with Got It By Voices where you're like, I would love to have been in this mate, at this era? Mate, I, for, I, when I, I run and I have compilations running um, and I just sing along and this sounds really lame. But I guess it's cool because it's rock and roll and I'm 50 and it's still something a kid would do. Right. But I imagine... And this is in no way a position I would I'm I'm looking for, but yeah, I I imagine I imagine performing those songs. Yeah, I imagine performing them because they're that great. Yeah, that, and they fill me with so much good stuff that I'm just I imagine performing them. I get a lot of visions from listening to the music and 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 while I'm running, and a lot of visualization, and that's how riding the load came about i even want i just thought i want a gang of my own i want my own gang right i want that and it's never gonna be that but it's it's just my own little gang but yeah i do i've imagined myself you know singing those songs we've covered them a few times and but yeah fucking hell, i mean that was it wasn't it yeah. you just stood in the audience and went i want to be in that band <laughs> totally you were in it i want to i, I want to be that guy <laughs> I know. I mean, he's still out there. He's playing quite a bit these days. He's really seen more music than ever. And so yeah. I don't see, I don't see this slowing down. It, it obviously is not slowing him down in any way. He's, he's defiant to make his art. Yeah. Those two. And that's the thing. He's a true artist and that's what drives him. Those two shows in Dayton back in August the first night we came away and this man, how he moved on stage, how he gets into the music and, you know, how he moves around, how he engages, you know, and you're just like, this guy's so full of life and he's so fucking cool and he still, he looks cool and he's, you know, he's in his sixties and he's still so cool. And if we'd have gone away Friday and not seen the next night, we'd have, we'd have got on a plane very, very happy. And we went the Saturday night and just went, that's that's just ridiculous what we just saw. It was like watching a different band. Uh, it was just bizarre. And I went, 
I, I, there's no way that you can possibly top what you did the night before. I don't want to disappoint anybody that only went on the Friday. <laughs> but I don't know what happened on the Saturday. And you went, fuck, you know, this is like ridiculous. Yes. It's, it, it just flows through him, flows through them. And, you know, credit to all the band members that have gone through the years, yourself included. Um, you know, and, the, and all the guys with him now, and Doug, who's been with him for years, and Kev, and it's just, well, what a universe they've created. It's unbelievable. It is. It's incredible. Well, at the end of every interview, I ask the same question, but I tailor it depending on the film we're talking about. So on a scale from one to 10, with one being the lowest, and I'm gonna bump up the number, I'm not gonna do 10. We're gonna do two million. Okay, two million. From one to two million. How many patented, exquisite Robert Pollard leg kicks do you give this documentary? It's such an incredible document to have. And, and, it's, and I'll tell you why it's such an important documentary because it's such a fantastic gateway into the world of Robert Pollard. Even, even you know, watching it now, even if you're new to the band, if you watch that, you're going to get a sense of what this band is about and what this, this guy is about. But I give it two million and one leg kicks. I think that's absolutely right. <laughs> do, you, do you ever get the feeling that there will be another GBB documentary or Bob documentary at some point? I, I kind of feel like there won't. No, I don't think there will. Years ago, um, we tried to make one ourselves. Um, Adam Buxton got involved in it and knocked up a treatment. And I sent it over and said, you know, listen, this we'd love to do a documentary on Bob. Right. And, um, you know, we got the word back and it was like, he's not really interested in having a documentary made. This was some years ago now. And I'm like, well, it's fair enough. You know, I, you know, I, I, it never deterred me or anything. And I respect people's wishes. You know, I get asked to do shit. And so I, I, I totally got it. But I would love there to be one. I mean, I, I really think there should be a, a great Guided by Voices movie. There's so many documentaries now out there on Prime Video, you know, great for music docs. And why haven't this band got the, you know, the definitively great documentary? I think it should be made, but I can't make it. I could only do something like that with Bob's consent. Right. So, you know, otherwise I wouldn't want to do it. But I think it needs to be made. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in agreement. He needs someone more persistent than me. Like Edgar Wright's so fucking persistent and he wants to do something. Okay. He'd be perfect, you know, so I need to get him into the band. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, Patty, this has been brilliant. Thanks so much. It's so good to see you. And I'm so glad we met in Kentucky. You know, we both Yeah, we did. We both flew flew a long way. You obviously flew further. But there's not many bands we would fly to go see and uh you know, Bob is one of those people. Definitely. Yeah. No, I'll go back. We'll go back to date. You should come next time. Sounds brilliant. Let's do it. I need some of that weird square pizza. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That 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 Marion's pizza they rave about. I went in with Matt Davis and he, he, he goes, oh, this is classic. You know, it was a great place. All the pictures on the walls. And then I got this pizza. I went, what the hell is that place? <laughs> I know I you're like, how, get some, how do I start? I we're getting pizza. <laughs> <laughs> There's like a load of mincemeat on some kind of crispy bread. Oh, where's the cheese? Where's... That's great. <laughs> well, it sounds like a date. It sounds great. Thanks again, Patty. It was great. Hey, brilliant, Chris. Loads of love, man. Good to see you, brother. Thank you for listening to Revolutions Per Movie. We release new episodes every Thursday. We are a completely independently produced affair, so the best way to support us is to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app and to subscribe to our Patreon over at patreon.com slash revolutions per movie, where you can get exclusive weekly bonus episodes every Sunday, as well as one-of-a-kind handmade revolutions per movie goods that I send out to you. You can follow the show on social media at revolutions per movie and find more information about our various guests in the episode show notes. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week. Bye.